This week on Jerusalem Dateline, for the first time, Iran admits it could pursue a nuclear bomb. And Israel slams the International Criminal Court for deciding it has jurisdiction to investigate the Jewish state for war crimes. And could a new Israeli drug hold the key to blunting the COVID-19 pandemic? All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. For the first time, a major Iranian leader has said publicly that Iran could pursue a nuclear bomb. The unprecedented statement raised the stakes in the growing nuclear confrontation between Israel, Iran, and the U.S. Iran's intelligence minister issued the warning. He claimed Iran's nuclear program is peaceful, and Iran's Supreme Leader Khamenei issued a fatwa forbidding a nuclear weapon. But he added, if pressured, Iran could change course. If a cat is cornered, it may show a kind of behavior that a free cat would not. If Iran is pushed in that direction, then it wouldn't be Iran's fault, but those who pushed it. Under normal circumstances, Iran does not have such a program and intent at all. But these are not normal circumstances. Alavi's threat comes after Iran announced it's now enriching uranium one step away from military-grade uranium and researching uranium metal, a key component of a nuclear bomb. As we see it, Iran will not stop enriching uh, uranium. They never want to do. They don't today, and they will not in the future. While the enrichment goes on, Iran, Khamenei and President Biden are in a face-off. Khamenei says no new deal unless the U.S. lifts sanctions. And Biden says no sanctions relief unless Iran returns to the negotiating table. Will the U.S. lift sanctions first in order to get Iran back to the negotiating table? No. They have to stop enriching uranium first. Here in Israel on Tuesday, Israel Defense Forces estimated Iran is two years from getting a nuclear bomb. Secretary of State Antony Blinken recently said they might be weeks away. But some say it's simply a political decision by Iran's leaders. Technologically and scientifically, we don't see the time as a real problem. So it's not, it's not the time problem, so it can say weeks or months or a year or two years, only about the political situation you want to represent. In the meantime, Israel's chief of staff has already said Israel's military is preparing operational plans in case Israel needs to attack Iran's nuclear facilities. We'll have more on the growing threat of Iran later in our program with Middle East expert Caroline Glick. Israel slammed the decision by the International Criminal Court that it now has jurisdiction to investigate war crimes against the Jewish state. Israel is looking for the ICC prosecutor to hold off on any investigations, but the landmark decision could put Israel on the defensive against potential charges from the UN court. The impact could be widespread, as the ruling includes Israelis who were involved in events ranging from Israel's 2014 war with Hamas to Palestinian mass demonstrations along the Gaza-Israeli border beginning in 2018. That would mean Israeli politicians, Israeli leaders, Israeli officials, and most of all, of course, Israeli military members, basically for any acts which are alleged to be criminal that have been committed since July 2014. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu blasted the decision. When the ICC investigates Israel for fake war crimes, this is pure anti-Semitism. The court established to prevent atrocities like the Nazi Holocaust against the Jewish people is now targeting the one state of the Jewish people. First, it outrageously claims that when Jews live in our homeland, this is a war crime. Second, it claims that when democratic Israel defends itself against terrorists who murder our children, rocket our cities, we're committing another war crime. Israel says for years Hamas has fired thousands of rockets indiscriminately into civilian areas, while they respond with targeted military responses. Hamas is also open to ICC investigations, but they applauded the move. 
Hamas considers this an important step towards justice for our Palestinian people and prosecute the Israeli war criminals. The most important steps remain, taking practical measures on the ground to hold the Israeli war criminals accountable and punish them for their crimes and everything they have done against our unarmed people. It could also mean Jewish communities in Israel's biblical heartland, also known as the West Bank, might be considered illegal since the ICC calls this area occupied territory. It could put Israeli leaders and possibly civilians traveling to countries bound by the ICC treaty in danger. Because they will be obliged by the treaty holding the ICC together to extradite suspects of the ICC to The Hague for interrogation, arrest, trial or whatever it may be. The two to one decision is not the final step. The matter now shifts to the ICC's chief prosecutor for a final decision to see if war crimes will be charged. Here in Israel, a drug that has seen great results in initial trials could hold a key in blunting the COVID-19 pandemic. As CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl tells us, the researchers are eager to take the treatment to the next steps toward approval. Sonia Cohen could one day be seen as a walking miracle. I want to say thank you for everything. You saved my life. I was in a poor condition and now I'm better. Coming to the hospital with COVID-19, she was unable to breathe. She was placed in intensive care and needed oxygen. That's when Professor Nadir Arbor came to her and asked if she would be part of a clinical trial for a new drug. Sonia said yes. From the first dose of the trial drug, it's possible to say I felt a lot better. After two days, I got off the oxygen in stages and I could breathe. Doctors here at Ehilov Hospital believe they have found a cure to the COVID-19 virus. They say just five doses from a little bottle like this could end the worldwide pandemic. This is a drug. It is very simple. You give it to patients, to patients with severe disease before they're going to deteriorate into very severe disease that mandate ventilations and even mortality. Professor Arbor is director of research on developing the anti-coronavirus drug ExoCD24, a treatment derived from a cell line established from a child aborted decades ago. We don't really treat the corona, we treat it the endpoint. There is overreactions of the immune system. The immune system is acting furiously and mainly in the lung releasing a lot of cytokines and chemokines that usually fight infections, but now they're destroying the lung tissue. That's the point they intervene and administer their treatment, which Arbor says interrupts this cytokine storm. And we give it by inhalation. It's very simple. It's like two to three minutes per day, and you do it for five days. So we enrolled 30 patients in the phase one, and we checked for safety and the drug was very safe, no side effects whatsoever. All 30 patients in that phase one trial recovered. And most of them went home after three to five days. While Arbor believes the vaccination push is important, he also feels this drug could have an even bigger impact if the remaining two phases of important human trials are successful. The biggest advantage of my drug, if it's effective of course, is that I can produce it fast, efficient and cheap. Within a few months, I can supply the entire world needs. Arbor recently briefed Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on the treatment's progress. Later, at a press conference with the visiting Greek Prime Minister, Netanyahu praised results and reported Greek hospitals would join in the clinical trials. If you're infected by corona and you're seriously ill and you have a lung problem, you take this, you inhale this with a saline solution, and you come out feeling good. Arbor says many more countries want to participate, and he believes this could be just the beginning. And then it's going to be the platform for many other diseases with overreaction, like auto autoimmune disease, in the lung and the entire body. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Ichilov Hospital, Tel Aviv. Coming up, disturbing parallels between the branding of Trump supporters and communist regimes.
French President Emmanuel Macron blasted social media recently for banning former President Trump from Facebook and Twitter after using the same platforms to egg him on during his presidency. Now Americans are being rooted out and punished for their support of President Trump. This vile treatment smacks of McCarthyism from the U.S. in the 1950s, with even more disturbing parallels. Dale Hurd brings us this alarming report. This was an attorney for PBS caught on camera saying the children of Trump supporters should be taken away from their parents and put in re-education camps. He was later fired, while voices in the media still call for Trump supporters to be deprogrammed. There are millions of Americans, um, almost all white, almost all Republicans, who somehow need to be deprogrammed. And the question is, how are we going to really almost deprogram these people who have signed up for the cult of Trump? Trump supporters are also being called mentally ill and are being censored, doxxed, deplatformed, blacklisted, and demonetized. It's giving some who have lived in communist countries flashbacks. For those who lived under communist dictatorships, What's happening in America has some disturbing parallels. Chinese pastor Bob Fu was a student leader during the Tiananmen Square pro-democracy demonstrations in 1989. He was also a proud attendee of the January 6th Trump rally on the National Mall. He says the call to re-educate and deprogram Trump supporters is straight out of the Chinese Communist Party playbook. It's absolutely uh, these kind of tactics. Uh, they all requires forced conformity. And if you don't comply, then you will be punished. Elizabeth Rogliani's family had to flee Venezuela when Hugo Chavez took power. Her video warning last year to Americans about the similarities between the Antifa and Black Lives Matter rioting and what happened in Venezuela went viral. I've already lived through this thing when I was living in Venezuela. She says the labeling of Trump supporters as potential domestic terrorists was a tactic Hugo Chavez used to stigmatize his political opposition. Calling out opposition or Republicans as terrorists or fascists, that is the kind of language I saw a lot. Uh, late President Hugo Chavez used to call us fascists and terrorists as well. Rogliani says one ominous sign for America has been all the conservatives flocking to more secure messaging platforms like Telegram, because that's exactly what happened in Venezuela when the Democratic opposition was deplatformed and opposition leaders began to be arrested. We jumped into Telegram really early on, so I had it for years. I find that very interesting how it's happening so fast here. Jason Poblet's grandfather had to flee Cuba when Fidel Castro took power. Poblet, an attorney who has worked in Congress, is president of the Global Liberty Alliance and says what happened in Cuba is replaying in the United States. Dale, it's painful to watch. It's not something that I ever thought I would see in the United States, in Cuba, the socialist facilitators had been laying the groundwork. And by the time Fidel Castro rolled in, uh, they had already laid that framework in place to take the government over. German evangelist and author Heidi Munt grew up in former communist East Germany, which called itself the German Democratic Republic. And she has harsh words for America's Democrats. Your Democrats remind me to the German Democratic Republic, so the communist part of Germany, the east part of Germany. They also called themselves Democrats, but they were socialists, communists. When Heidi, as a young woman, began to speak out against the East German government, she paid the price. My career stopped, you know, it was broken. So I could not find a job anymore. Dissidents in East Germany and the old Soviet bloc were also called mentally ill and sent to hospitals, as they are today in China. Children were also taken away from dissidents. In East Germany, uh, they took away, they really took away children. They put them in, um, in orphanages and uh, the parents did not get them back. All these, uh, you know, deplatforming, this kind of thing are exactly happening in China.
They're using the similar tactics with the same playbook. Jason Poblet said if his grandfather, who loved America deeply, was alive today to see how Trump supporters are being demonized, he would be scared. And then he would tell me, hey, Jason, what are you doing about it? <laughs> because you can't go anywhere. I mean, this is it. There's nowhere for us to go. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Coming up, our interview with Middle East expert Caroline Glick about the new U.S. administration, Israel, and the growing menace of Iran. For more on the ominous signs coming out of Iran and how the new U.S. administration is handling those threats, we spoke to Middle East expert, author, and columnist Caroline Glick. Caroline Glick, thanks for joining us on Jerusalem Dateline. What's your initial thoughts about the new foreign policy team for Biden and the Biden administration in general? Well, I mean, the new foreign policy team is very familiar because it was uh, it was Obama's foreign policy team. It's the exact same people, and they're in very similar positions. Uh, in the Biden administration, and um, they're really picking up where Obama left off. They're doing everything that they can to cancel the last four years of the Trump administration, not only at home in the United States, but also here in the, in, in the Middle East. And we see this first and foremost, most directly with their policies towards Iran and its nuclear weapons program and its operations, its regional aggression, particularly in Yemen. What's your main concern about the, uh, the their approach to the Iranian nuclear deal? The nuclear deal with Iran was pegged as a as a non-proliferation agreement. Obama himself said that at the end of the lifespan of the nuclear deal, and it was scheduled to end somewhere between 2025 and 2028, that Iran's breakout time to independent nuclear military capabilities was going to be zero. The Iran nuclear deal didn't stop Iran from getting nuclear capabilities to build nuclear weapons. It enabled them to do so, and it legitimized their efforts to do so. And aside from that, the sanctions that the JCPOA, that the uh, Iran nuclear deal, gave to Iran enabled them to fund their regional aggression, their sponsorship of terrorism globally, and their proxy wars in Yemen and Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and Gaza. The Obama administration's Iran policy was to empower Iran and to do so against you, America's traditional allies, the Arab states and the Gulf, Egypt and, and Israel. By reinstating them now and doing so, you know, with all of the energy and and focus that they can muster. President Biden himself at the top and his team are pushing on with that policy. And uh, as a consequence, they're facilitating Iran's rise as a nuclear power and as a regional hegemon. Iran's intelligence minister gave a veiled threat that they can actually go ahead and get a nuclear weapon. How would you describe the current state of affairs between Israel, Iran, and the U.S. in terms of their nuclear program? Well, I think that Iran recognizes that the United States has said, fine, do whatever you want, and we'll support that. Now, Biden made this seemingly hard-boiled statement in his interview with Nora O'Donnell from CBS News over the weekend, where he said that the United States wasn't going to end its economic sanctions on Iran until Iran scales back its nuclear activities to come into line with the limitations they accepted in the, in the nuclear deal. But really, that was not true. It was already reported that the administration is seeking different ways, aside mm -hmm. from ending the economic sanctions, to give money to Iran. So one of the things that they're working on now is to get the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to make a large loan to Iran that the United States would back even as Iran is actively breaching its commitments under the nuclear deal and, again, taking steps, making advances in its nuclear capabilities that bring it really to the door of independent nuclear military capabilities. So what we're talking about here is that Biden is playing with Iran about their nuclear program. The Iranians recognize this. And as to Israel in this mix, I mean, I think the chief of staff of the IDF, Aviv Kohavi, gave a speech last month that he's given orders to the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces Operational Command, to prepare plans to strike Iran's nuclear installations. And obviously that those are going to be contingent on receiving the approval of Prime Minister Netanyahu. And a lot of the commentary about the statement was saying that he was trying to deter Iran or that uh, say, hey, look, you better not do this or we're going to come get your nuclear site. Or even trying to signal to the Biden administration that Israel wasn't party to their appeasement efforts. But I think that given the pace of uh, Iran's nuclear progress, I mean, they're 
enriching uranium to 20% in two sites uh, using advanced centrifuges. And last week, they tested a rocket in low orbit that can just as easily be used as an intercontinental ballistic missile that's capable of reaching Britain. They're producing uh, uranium metals. All of these things are things that you do in order to uh, to, to put together nuclear warheads along the lines that the uh, Iranian minister was talking about in this television interview. Um, so I think that it's probably more likely that Kohavi was telegraphing a message to two different parties. One is the Israeli public, that we have to be aware that war is, is approaching, at least since Biden came in. And the other target audience, I think, were Israel's allies in the Persian Gulf, the UAE, Bahrain, and uh, less publicly, but very significantly, Saudi Arabia. Well, Caroline Glick, thanks for your uh, insight analysis and uh, for being here with uh, Jerusalem Dateline. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you and all of your viewers. Thank you for your support for Israel. Coming up, it's called a night to shine for these special needs girls, courtesy of the Tim Tebow Foundation. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, the Tim Tebow Foundation, along with some local organizations, held an event called A Night to Shine for some special needs girls. The event is based on what a prom night would be like. This night, every girl was a queen. Tonight is the first time ever in Israel that um, a prom night, a night to shine, has been held. And we just want to make the young women with special needs feel very special and let them know how much God loves them and how beautiful they are. And it worked. Even after the quarantine that they were alone in houses and stuff, and really you can see that the girls went out of the homes and get pretty and dance and it really feels like a princess. So thank you very much. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blast so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.